the fallen Marines. Today is Veterans Day, and you may think it odd that I am wearing my uniform today, but um, today I will be rendering honors to 30 veterans who have served and are now close to the end of their lives. And so the hospices in the United States, and particularly the hospice of the Chesapeake, of which my wife is a part, have been sponsoring honor salutes for several years now because they felt that veterans would appreciate being honored for their service before their death so that they could at least understand how much their fellow military personnel appreciate their service. And I certainly do, because all of those men are among those men that kept me alive when I was um, serving my tour of duty in Vietnam. And so today, um, I want to give you a sense of what the um, what, what is important to us in terms of understanding from a symbolic point of view um, what the military means and what it costs. And Elias Canetti, who was a Jew, uh, wrote an outstanding book that tells us something important about this. And so I'm going to render my salute um, and read from Mr. Kennedy's book. This is the book, Crowds and Power, by Elias Kennedy. And uh, Mr. Canetti won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, many people thought it was because of this book, but it, he also wrote another book, uh, which is a novel, the only novel he ever wrote, called Auto de Fe. And both of these books are extremely powerful, as you might guess. He didn't win the Nobel Prize for Literature for nothing. And... Um, so it is a symbolic act for me to uh, be in uniform during this presentation. And because I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, it is my privilege to wear my uniform whenever I want, although uh, I retired 27 years ago. And so today I'm reading from um, Crowds and Power by Elias Canetti, Part 4, The Crowd in History. And I'll be reading from pages 169 to 183. It's published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud. And so I urge you to get a copy of it and read it in its entirely. But this part is about national symbols, and as I get into it further, you'll understand why I'm reading this today. Most attempts to find out what nations really are have suffered from an intrinsic defect. They have been attempts to define the general concept of nationality. People have said that a nation is this or that, apparently believing that all that mattered was to find the right definition. Once found, this would be applicable to all nations equally. They have adduced language or territory, written literature, history, form of government, or so-called national feeling, and in every case, the exceptions have proved more important than the rule. It has been like clutching at some adventitious gar 
It has been like clutching at some adventitious garment in the belief that the living creature within could be thus grasped. Apart from this seemingly objective approach, there is another more naive one, which consists in being interested in one nation only, one's own, the indifference, the indifferent to all the rest, and indifferent to all the rest. Its components are an unshakable belief in the superiority of this one nation, prophetic visions of unique greatness, and a peculiar mixture of moral and feral pretensions. But it must not be assumed that all these national ideologies, but it must not be assumed that all these national ideologies have the same content. It is only in their importunate appetite and the claims they make that they are alike. They want the same thing, but in thems, but in themselves they are different. They want aggrandizement and substantiate their claim with the fact of their increase. There is no nation, it seems, which has not promised the whole earth, and none which is not bound to inherit it in the course of nature. All the other nations who hear of this feel threatened, and their fear blinds them to everything except the threat. Thus people overlook the fact that the concrete contents of these national claims, the real ideologies behind them, are very different from one another. One must take the trouble to find out what is peculiar in each nation and do it without being infected by its greed. One must stand apart, a devotee of none, but profoundly and honestly interested in all of them. One should allow each to unfold in one's mind as though one were condemned actually to belong to it for a good part of a lifetime, but one must never surrender entirely to one at the cost of all the others. For it is idle to speak of nations as though they were not real differences between them. They wage long wars against one another, and a considerable proportion of each nation takes an active part in these wars. What they are fighting for is proclaimed often enough, but what they fight as is but what they fight as is unknown. It is true that they have a name for it. They, th they say they fight as Frenchmen or as Germans, English or Japanese, but what meaning is attached to any of these words by the person using it of himself? In what does he believe himself to be different when as Frenchman or a German, a Japanese or an Englishman, he goes to war. The factual differences do not matter so much. An investigation of customs, traditions, politics, and literature could be thorough and still not touch the distinctive character of a nation. That which, when it goes to war, becomes its faith. Thus nations are regarded here as though they were religions, and they do, in fact, tend to turn into something resembling religions from time to time. The germ is always latent in them, becoming active in times of war. We can take it for granted that no member of a nation ever sees himself as alone. As soon as he is named, or names himself, something more comprehensive moves into his consciousness, a larger unit of which he feels himself to be related. The nature of this unit is no more a matter of indifference than his relationship to it. It is not simply the geographical unit of his country as it is found on a map. The average man is indifferent to this. Frontiers may have their tension for him, but not the whole area of a country. 
nor does he think of his language distinctly and recognizably, though this may differ from that of others. Words which are familiar to him certainly affect him deeply, and especially in times of excitement. But it is not a vocabulary which stands behind him and which is ready to fight for, and which he is ready to fight for, and the history of his nation and the history of his nation means even less to the man in the street. He does not know its true course, nor the fullness of its continuity. He does not know how his nation used to live, and only a few of the names of those who lived before him. The figures and moments of which he is aware are remote from anything the proper historian understands as history. <clears throat> the figures and moments of which he is aware are remote, are remote from anything the proper historian understands as history. The larger unit to which he feels himself related is always a crowd or a crowd symbol. It always has some of the characteristics of crowds or their symbols. Density, growth and infinite openness, surprising, very striking, cohesion, a common rhythm or a sudden discharge. Many of these symbols have already been treated at length. For example, sea, forest and corn. It is unnecessary to recapitulate here the qualities and functions which have made them crowd symbols. They will recur in the discussion of the conceptions and feelings nations have about themselves, but it must be stressed that these crowd symbols are never seen as naked or isolated. Every member of a nation always sees himself or his picture of himself in a fixed relationship to the particular symbol, which has become the most important for his nation. In his periodic reappearance, when the moment demands it, lies the continuity of national feeling. A nation's consciousness of itself changes when and only well, and only when its symbol changes. It is less immutable than one supposes a fact which offers some hope for the continued existence of mankind. In the following pages, an attempt, in the following pages, an attempt is made to consider a few nations with reference to their symbols. In order to follow the argument without bias, the reader should imagine himself back about 20 years. And this was written in 1960, so one should imagine himself back in 1940. <clears throat> and it is essential that he should remember that I am here reducing things to their simplest and most general form, and hence shall be saying very little about men as individuals. The English. It is advisable to begin with a nation which, though it does not make much public parade of its identity, yet undoubtedly retains the most stable national feeling in the world today. With England, everyone knows what the sea means to an Englishman. What is not sufficiently known is the precise form of the connection between his relationship to the sea and his famous individualism. The Englishman sees himself as a captain on board a ship with a small group of people, the sea around and beneath him. He is almost alone. As captain, he is in many ways isolated, even from his crew. The sea is there to be ruled. This conception is decisive. Ships are as much alone on its vast surface as isolated individuals, and each is personified in its captain. His power of command is absolute and undisputed. The course he steers, 
The course he steers is a command he gives the sea. The fact that it the fact that it is carried out through the medium of the crew makes people forget that it is actually the sea which has to obey. The captain decides on the goal and the sea, as though it were alive, carries him there, though not without storms or other manifestations of hostility. Considering the immensity of the sea, it is a matter of some importance whom it obeys most frequently. Obedience comes more easily to it when the goal is some British territory. When this is so, the sea behaves like a horse which knows the way and its rider. A ship of another nation is like an unpracticed rider on a borrowed horse. The horse behaves much worse than when its master is riding it. The sea, too, is so large that the number of ships by which it is controlled is also important. When one comes to consider the character of the sea itself, one must remember how numerous and violent are the changes to which it is subject. It is more varied in its transformations than any of the animal crowds with which men have dealings, and how harmless and stable compared to the sea are the hunter's forests and the farmer's fields. The Englishman's disasters have been experienced at sea. His dead he has often had to imagine lying at the bottom of the sea, and thus the sea has offered him transformation and danger. His life at home is complementary to life at sea. Security and monotony are its essential characteristics. Everyone has his place which, except to go to sea, he is not supposed to leave for the sake of any transformation. Everyone is as sure of his habits as his possessions. The Dutch. The importance of national crowd symbols can be seen particularly clearly in the contrast between the English and the Dutch. The two peoples come of similar stock, their languages are related, and the religious development of both countries is virtually the same. Both are seafaring nations and founders of maritime empires. The destiny of the Dutch sea captain on a voyage of trade and discovery differed in no way from that of an English captain. The wars they fought with each other were those of closely related rivals, and yet there is a difference between them which may appear insignificant but, in fact, is very important. It concerns their national crowd symbols. The English conquered their island, but they did not wrest it from the sea. It is through his ships alone that the Englishman subject, subjugates the it is through his ships alone that the Englishman subjugates the sea. Its ruler is the ship's captain. The Dutchman had to win the land. The Dutchman had to win the land he inhabits from the sea. It is so low lying that he has to protect it by dikes. The dikes are the beginning and end of his national life. The crowd of men equates itself with the dike and together they withstand the sea. If the dikes are damaged, the land is endangered. In times of crisis, the dikes are breached, and the Dutch find safety from their enemies on artificial islands. Nowhere else has the feeling of a human wall opposing the sea been so strongly developed. In peacetime, people rely on the dikes, but when they have to be destroyed in front of an ant, but when they have to be destroyed in front of an advancing enemy, their strength is transmitted to the men who will erect them again after the war. The dike maintains itself in their faith until it can become reality again. In a curious and unmistakable way, the Dutch, in time of real danger, carry their barriers against the sea within themselves. 
whenever the British, whenever the English were attacked on their island, lied on the sea, with storms it came to their aid against their enemies. Hmm. I seem to have a frozen. Okay. I have to do a time set. Okay, sound check's okay. Sorry, my image froze for a moment, but I'm continuing. I'll go back. In a curious and unmistakable way, the Dutch, in time of real danger, carry their, carry their barriers against the sea within themselves. Whenever the English were attacked on their island, they relied on the sea. With storms, it came to their aid against their enemies. They were sure of their island, and in their ships, each of them felt the same security. The Dutch, on the other hand, always had danger at their back. For them, the sea was never entirely subdued. It is true that they sailed upon it to the ends of the earth, but it might always turn against them at home and in times of extremity, they had to turn the sea even against themselves in order to keep back the enemy who threatened them. And um, I just mention as an aside here that during the 80 years war, which ended with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, it was customary for the Spanish Catholics to come to Holland every summer and try to beat the Dutch into coming back into Catholicism. Uh, the hard-headed Dutchman refused that and at the end of every planting season they would flood their country and the Spanish would go back to sunny Spain. That went on for 80 years um, and during in the midst of that some of my ancestors came to the New World, and five of them became five of the first 150 citizens, residents, uh, European residents of Manhattan Island. The Germans. The crowd symbol of the Germans was the army, but the army was more than just the army. It was the marching forest. In no other modern country has the forest feeling remained as alive as it has in Germany. The, par the parallel rigidity of the upright trees and their density and number fill the heart of the German with a deep and mysterious delight. To this day, he loves to go deep into the forest where his forefathers lived. He feels at one with the trees. Their orderly separation and the stress on the vertical distinguished and the stress on the vertical distinguished this forest from the tropical kind where creepers grow in all directions. In tropical forests, the eye loses itself in the foreground. There is a chaotic and unarticulated mass of growth full of color and life, which effectively precludes any sensation of order or even of repetition. The forests of the temperate zone, on the other hand, have a conspicuous rhythm. The eye moves along lines of clearly visible trees in, into a uniform distance. Each individual tree is always taller than a man and goes on growing until it becomes a giant. Its steadfastness has much in common with the same virtue in a warrior. In a single tree, the bark resembles a coat of mail. In a whole forest, where there are many trees of the same kind growing together, it suggests rather the uniforms of an army. For the German, without his being clearly aware of it, army and forest transfused each other in every possible way. What to others might seem the army's dreariness and barrenness kept for the German the life and flow of the forest. He was never afraid in it. 
He felt protected, one amongst many. He took the rigidity and straightness of the trees for his own law. The boy who escaped into the forest from the confinement of home, thinking to be alone there and able to dream, actually anticipated his entry into the army. In the forest, he found the others waiting for him, true, faithful, and upright, as he himself wanted to be. Each like every other, for each grows straight and yet quite different in height and strength. The effect of this early forest romanticism on the German must never be underrated. He absorbed it. He absorbed it from countless poems and songs, and the forest which appears in these is often called German. The Englishman likes to imagine himself at sea, the German in a forest. It is impossible to express the difference of their national feeling more concisely. The French. The present crowd symbol of the French is of recent date. It is their revolution. The Feast of Liberty is celebrated once a year and has become the special occasion of national rejoicing. On the 14th July, anyone may dance in the streets with anyone. People who are just as little free, equal, and fraternal as in other countries can for once behave as though they were. The Bastille is stormed. The streets are again as full as they were then. The crowd, for centuries the victim of royal justice, take justice into their own hands. Um, I'm going to abbreviate the rest of the French, but please read it from Crowds and Power by Elias Canetti. The Swiss. Switzerland is a state whose national cohesion is indisputable. The patriotic feeling of the Swiss is greater than that of many peoples who speak only one language. The four languages spoken in Switzerland, the diversity of the cantons, their different social structures, the division into two religious confessions, whose wars are still fresh in memory, none of this seriously weakens the national consciousness of the Swiss. But then the crowd symbol they have in common is their mountains. It is always before their eyes, unshakable and impregnable, to a degree equal by to a degree equaled by no other national symbol. The Swiss can see the tops of their mountains from everywhere, but there are points from which the chain appears more complete. The feeling that from them all the mountains can be seen together endows such places with an element of sacredness. Sometimes on evenings which cannot be predicted in advance and over which man has no influence, the mountains begin to glow. This is their highest consecration. The, gift of, the difficulty of access to them and their hardness give the Swiss a feeling of security. The peaks are divided but below the mountains are linked like the limbs of a single gigantic body. They are one body, and that body is the country itself. The Swiss plans for defense during the last two wars express this equation of the nation and the chain of the Alps in a curious way. In the case of an attack, all the fertile land all the cities and all the centers of production were to be left undefended. The army was to retire to the mountains and would only have fought there. People and country would appear to have been sacrificed, but Switzerland would still have been represented by the army of its mountains. The crowd symbol of the nation would have become the country itself. It is a special kind of dike which the Swiss have. They do not have to erect it themselves like the Dutch. They neither build it nor breach it, and no sea pounds against it. The mountains stand, and all the Swiss have to do 
is to know them thoroughly. Every section of them is climbed or traveled over. The Alps act like a magnet, attracting from all countries people who emulate the Swiss in admiring and exploring them. From whatever country they come, mountaineers are like devout Swiss. The army of them scouted, scattered through the world after brief periodic terms of service in the mountains keeps the prestige of Switzerland alive. It would be worth exploring the extent of their practical contribution to the preservation of Swiss independence. Now, there's also a section on the Spaniards and the Italians and the Jews, but I'm going to uh, leave those aside because there's a part of this that relates to World War I and World War II, and it's that part that I want to read with you um, after our moment of reflection. Um, it's a hundred years since about eight million men, four million on the mm -hmm. Allies side and four million on the German side, were killed in World War I by machine gun fire mainly. And it's that which we are remembering today. And uh, in the Marine Corps, we always remember the service and duty of the second marine division in the battle of bellow wood and uh, in that battle um, well as a result of that battle uh, the french awarded the second marine division the forager which is a, a rope device let's see it's on this shoulder i guess rope device uh, in green and red, which all members of the 2nd Marine Division wear. And so if you ever are in an airport and you see a Marine with the Forager, you'll know that, is, that it is for um, the Battle of Bella Wood. And um, On days like this, which are very symbolic, uh, I often think of um, uh, three Marines that I know personally. Two of them uh, were members of my class at the basic school, class uh, 1268. Uh, we began service on June the 12th, 1968, as second lieutenants. My roommate, Second Lieutenant Robert M. Christian Jr. was killed in Vietnam on April the 11th, 1969. And another friend, Rich Higgins, was killed by Hezbollah in Southern Lebanon when he was serving as the commander of UN forces in Southern Lebanon. Another is Joseph Wisniewski, who was the brother of a friend of mine locally, who was a corporal in the Marine Corps. And so I will be thinking of all of them. And I will take a minute of silence.
The next section of this chapter, which is relevant to this commemoration, is called Germany and Versailles. And I'd like to point out, since this is a young reading group, that Dr. Jung saw that World War II would come as early as 1919 because he saw it in the dreams and visions of his patients. Germany and Versailles. In order to clarify as much as possible some of the concepts I have formulated, I propose to add here a few words about the crowd structure of Germany, the Germany which, in the first third of this century, astonished the world with formations and tendencies of an entirely unprecedented kind, whose deadly seriousness went completely unrealized at the time, and which are only now beginning slowly to be understood. The crowd symbol of the United German Nations, which formed after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, to 71, was and remained the army. Every German was proud of the army, and it was only a few isolated individuals who were able to remain outside the influence of this symbol. It was the war which supplied even a universal thinker like Nietzsche with the stimulus of his chief work, the will to power. The sight he never forgot was that the sight he never forgot was that of the cavalry squadron. The point of this reference to Nietzsche is that he proves how general and the importance of the army had become in Germany, how this crowd symbol had an effect even on those who haughtily detached themselves from the crowd. Bourgeois and worker, peasant and scholar, Catholic and Protestant, Prussian and Bavarian, they all saw the army as the symbol of the nation. The deeper roots of this symbol its origin in the forest have already been uncovered. For a German, forest and army are so intimately connected that either can equally well stand as the crowd symbol of the nation. In this respect, they are identical. Apart from, his influence as, apart from its influence as a symbol, excuse me, Apart from its influence as a symbol, the army did also exist in a concrete form, and this fact was of decisive importance. A symbol lives in the minds and feelings of men, as did that curious entity, the forest army. The actual army, on the other hand, in which every young German served, functioned as a closed crowd the belief in universal military service, the conviction of its profound significance and the veneration accorded it had a wider reach than the traditional religions, for it embraced Catholics and Protestants alike. Anyone who excluded himself was no German. I said earlier that it was only in a very limited sense that armies could be called crowds. This, however, was not so with the Germany. This so, this, this, however, was not so with the German. The army was by far the most important closed crowd he experienced. 
it was closed because those belonging to it were either young men of certain age groups only who served for a limited period or, or professional soldiers, but every young man passed through it at some time and remained inwardly linked to it for the rest of his life. The Prussian Junker class, the Prussian Junker caste, which provided the greater part of its officers, acted as the crowd crystal of this army. It was like an order of chivalry with strict, though in this case unwritten, laws, or like a hereditary orchestra, thoroughly familiar with the music with which it has no with which it has to infect its audience. On the outbreak of the First World War, the whole German people became one open crowd. The enthusiasm of those days has often been described. Many people in other countries had been counting on the internationalism of the Social Democrats and were astounded at their failure to act. They forgot that the Social Democrats, too, bore, with them, bore within them this forest army symbol of their nation, that they themselves had belonged to the closed crowd of the army, and that whilst in it they had been under the command and influence of a highly disciplined and immensely effective crowd crystal, the Junker and Ar the Junker and officer caste, their membership of a political party carried very little weight in comparison with this. But those first August days of 1914 were also the days in which National Socialism was begotten. Hitler himself is our authority for this. He later described how, at the outbreak of war, he fell on his knees and thanked God. It was his decisive experience, the one moment at which he himself honestly became part of a crowd. He never forgot it, and his whole subsequent career was devoted to the recreation of this moment. But from outside, Germany was to be again as it was then, conscious of its military striking power and exalting and united in it. But Hitler would never have achieved his purpose had not the Treaty of Versailles disbanded the German army. The prohibitions on universal military service robbed the Germans of their most essential closed crowd. The activities they were denied, the exercises, the receiving and passing on of orders, became something which they had to procure for themselves once again at all costs. The prohibition on universal military service was the birth of National Socialism. Every closed crowd which is dissolved by force transforms itself into an open crowd to which it imparts all its own characteristics. The party came to the rescue of the army and the party had no limits to and the party had no limits set to its recruitment from within the nation every single german man woman or child soldier or civilian could become a national socialist he was probably even more anxious to become one if he had not been a soldier before because by doing so he achieved participation in activities hitherto denied him. Hitler used the slogan, the diktat of Versailles, with unparalleled and unwearying monotony, and many have marveled at its effectiveness. Repetition never weakened it. On the contrary, it grew stronger with the years. What was the actual content of this slogan? What was it that Hitler passed what was it that Hitler passed on to his audiences by it? To a German, the word Versailles did not so much mean the defeat, which he never really acknowledged, as the, pro as the prohibition of the army, the prohibition of specific and sacrosanct 
practices without which he could not really imagine life. The, prohib the prohibition of the army was like the prohibition of a religion. The faith of his fathers had been proscribed, and it was every man's sacred duty to reestablish it. Every time it was used, the word Versailles probed this wound and kept it bleeding so that it never closed. As long as the word Versailles was uttered with sufficient force at mass meetings, it was impossible for healing to begin. In this connection, it is important to notice that what was spoken of always a dictate. What was spoken of was always a diktat and never a treaty. Diktat belongs to the sphere of command, a single alien command, a command coming from the enemy and therefore dubbed diktat, had put an end to the whole virile activity of command among Germans themselves, that is, within the army. Anyone who heard or read the words diktat of Versailles felt in his depths what had been taken away from him, which was the German army. To, recon to, recon to reconstitute it seemed the only really important goal. Once it was there again, everything would be as it had been before. The army's importance as a national crowd symbol had never been shaken. The forest, which was the older and deeper rooted part of this symbol, still stood untouched. The choice of the word Versailles as his central slogan was therefore particularly fortunate from Hitler's point of view. Not only did it remind the Germans of the latest painful event in their life as a nation, of the prohibition of general conscription and the suppression of the right to an army in which every man could serve for a few years, but it also summed up other familiar and important moments of German history. It was at Versailles that Bismarck had founded the Second German Empire. The unity of Germany had been proclaimed there in the moment of elation and irresistible strength following a great victory, and the victory had been won over Napoleon III, who regarded himself as the successor of the great Napoleon and the inheritor of his spirit, and who had risen to power through the veneration accorded to his legendary name. But Versailles was also the seat of Louis XIV and had been built by him. Of all the French rulers before Napoleon, Louis XIV was the one who had most deeply humiliated the Germans. It was he who had incorporated Strasbourg with its cathedral into France, and it was his troops who had devastated the castle at Heidelberg. Thus the proclamation of the German Empire at Versailles was a belated victory over both Louis XIV and Napoleon together, and it had been won alone without the help of any ally. There is plenty of confirmation of the effect which the word Versailles had on Germans at this time, and it was inevitable that it should, for the name Versailles was bound up with the greatest triumph of modern German history. Every time Hitler spoke of the nor every time Hitler spoke of the notorious diktat, the memory of that triumph echoed in the word and was transmitted to his audience as a promise. If the former enemies of Germany had had ears to hear, they would have known it for the th they would have known it for a threat of war and defeat. With the exception of it can be maintained without exaggeration that all the important slogans of National Socialism, the Third Reich, the Sieg Heil, etc derived directly from the words, the diktat of Versailles. The whole content of the movement is concentrated in them. The defeat to be turned into victory, the prohibited army to be recreated for this purpose. 
Okay. So I'm going to stop reading there, but I have a few more comments. Um, after World War I, the United States uh, put very punitive prohibitions and other requirements on the German people, including reparations for the war. And this caused many Germans to live in abject poverty throughout the decade of the 1920s. After World War II, by contrast, we instituted the Marshall Plan, which rebuilt Western Europe both France and Germany and the UK and Japan. And by doing that, Germany and Japan and Italy became among the most loyal allies of the United States in the what was then to become the Cold War. Um, it so happened that I served in a hot battle of the Cold War, namely in the Vietnam War. Um, at the time, it didn't seem like we were fighting the Soviet Union, but it turned out in retrospect that economically we were. And I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud that we were involved in the Vietnam War, but I'm personally proud of my own service there. Now, this is about psychic epidemics too. And so you can see by this reading that psychic epidemics are transmitted by words. And so when we talk about words mattering in our politics, we have to think of those things. And I'd like to talk about some of the symbols that relate to the United States. Um, actually, it was very easy to see in the 21st century because immediately after 9-11, we saw American flags emerge everywhere, everywhere. And it was very common to see American flags flying on cars driving down the street. So nothing unified the United States more than the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and the attempted attack on the Capitol. Uh, and so the result of that was that the United States became a very unified country. And, and it's very clear that the American flag became the primary crowd symbol of the whole country. Now we have some other uh, symbols that are very important. Obviously the Statue of Liberty is very important and um, as you probably know uh, the Liberty Mutual Insurance Company does all of their does all of their advertisements in front of a uh, picture of the Statue of Liberty, and that's only because it means unity and uh, security for millions and millions, tens of millions of immigrants who point back to the Statue of Liberty as being the symbol which brought them to the United States. And as we still see, uh, people from around the world keep trying to come and want to come to the United States and we want them to come because we take in one and a half million immigrants every year intentionally because they add to the dynamism of the country and So the idea of bringing in immigrants to the United States, we wouldn't get our work done if we didn't bring in immigrants. So the growth of the country requires new immigrants uh, in order for that, to, that growth to happen. Now there's another symbol, uh, which is 
guns. And guns in the United States uh, represented to the average European American as independence. And so, although I don't agree with many parts of the gun debate in the United States, uh, the Second Amendment was about maintaining a militia and nothing more. Uh, it wasn't about making sure that everybody in their home could have an Uzi. Um, but nonetheless, that's part of our gun debate. But so that we understand the symbol of a gun to an American, it is that as Americans conquered North America, the uh, primarily European Americans, but also Spanish Americans did the same as we came to America and conquered both continents. Um, the gun was a very important aspect of that, and so it is a very important symbol to all Americans in one way or another. And I just make one other uh, national level observation about a symbol, and that symbol is Saturday Night Live, because uh, last night on Saturday Night Live, um, GOP Congressman Dan Crenshaw appeared, and Dan Crenshaw is the retired Navy SEAL who lost his eye in Afghanistan, and Pete Davidson had a week earlier offended Dan Crenshaw very much by his comments on Saturday Night Live. And so I go to a gym very often during the week, and there, um, but last night, um, Pete Davidson did apologize in public uh, to Dan Crenshaw and gave him the opportunity to retaliate in kind which was both funny and appropriate. Um, but anyway, my point about the gym I go to very often is that it has slogans on the walls, and one of them is, an apology is the super glue of life. And um, it seems to me that as we go forward, we Americans need to apologize to one another for our behavior toward one another. That seems evident. Now, um, let's see. Yeah. okay, so at the uh, U.S. Naval Academy, um, there are many symbols, and one of the important <clears throat> aspects of um, the service academies in the United States is that they bring mem uh, Americans from every state. In other words, every congressman and senator is granted nominations to the Naval Academy, West Point, the Air Force Academy, the Coast Guard Academy, <coughs> and, and King's Point. And the result of that is that we maintain our ability to understand one another across our national boundaries, which are states. And um, so the mixing together of all races, religions, national origins, and areas of the country at the service academies has provided a true strength of the United States. And um, I had noted on the commentary underneath this uh, video, uh, the retort of Captain Lloyd Williams uh, from 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, uh, when he arrived at Bella Wood the French were in retreat, and they 
wanted the Americans to fall back and create positions in retreat. And Captain Lloyd Williams is reputed to have said, retreat? Hell, I just got here. And uh, with that, the Marines of the 2nd Marine Division, and particularly of the 5th Marines, which was my unit in Vietnam, um, stopped the German onslaught that was coming. And, uh, but, but Captain Williams's comment was actually a throwback to a comment from uh, John Paul Jones. And so at the U.S. Naval Academy in the crypt underneath the chapel, which is the Cathedral of the Navy, and it is built on the form of a European chapel, but below it is the crypt of John Paul Jones, who was the founder of the U.S. Navy. And John Paul Jones is famous for having been in a battle with a British ship uh, during the Revolutionary War. His ship was Bonhomme Richard, and the British ship was HMS Serapis. And in the course of the battle, uh, Bonhomme Richard was uh, mortally damaged and was sinking and the British captain called across to John Paul Jones because fighting was at very close quarters in those days, called, a court, called across to him and said, if you surrender, I will save your crew. And John Paul Jones's famous reply was, surrender hell, I have not yet begun to fight. And that symbolic statement has been infused in the naval services of the United States since the time of John Paul Jones. And um, so for what it's worth, and um, let's see. And one other thing that's significant about um, the Navy is that the, the Navy hymn is very famous, but it has very strong Jungian connotations. So I want to share that. The words of the first verse of the Navy hymn uh, for you right now uh, so that you can understand the connection here. Um, the So the, the verse is this, Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm doth bind the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. O oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. And um, now let me go back and give you a Jungian connotation of this. Um, Eternal Father strong to save is a reference obviously to God or the God image in oneself, uh, whose arm doth bind the, rest, the restless wave. Here we might think of the restless wave as being humanity itself. Um, who bits the mighty ocean deep. Here we could refer to the ocean deep as the deep unconscious. And so the importance of depth psychology, its own appointed limits keep. Here are the limits of the unconscious by the conscious. And so even the unconscious has limits. And finally, uh, or not quite finally. Oh, here is when we cry to thee. Uh, this would be a prayer, including a meditation directed to the power center, which is the self, the God image, or the ineffable God himself. And finally, 
for those in peril on the sea we're all of us on the sea of the unconscious and therefore we must know that and learn how to use not only our unconscious but how to control our unconscious so that it keeps its appointed limits and um, the final point that I want to make on this presentation is that young men as they come along have to have some way to show that they are men and what um, what what came to my attention after the uh, Muslim attacks on a discotheque in Paris was that Anderson Cooper was interviewing two elder Muslim men um, in Paris about what was causing those kinds of outbreaks and they were talking about the abject poverty that the Muslim community in Paris was being held and those two men said that you have to understand that these men have no way of showing that they are men they have no way of having a job or building a family and so those archetypal they didn't say it in this way but those archetypal forces uh, cause them to want to find some way to demonstrate that they are men and as we think of uh, the plight of all human beings around the world it seems to me that we have to think about how we can make the lives of others around the world better uh, when we look at refugees coming from Costa Rica or El Salvador for example um, what does the name of those countries mean well Costa Rica means rich coast and El Salvador means uh, the savior and so at some point in history those that was the perception of those countries but people no longer can live in those countries very well and so they're trying to find a place that they can live but if we can find a way to help them in their own countries and if we can find a way to employ the unemployed and recover the misfits of our society who are generally the people who commit uh, mass murders for example if we find a way to recover those people and bring them back into human society uh, then it seems to me we will be much better off and so i urge you to meditate on those ideas um, as you meditate on the importance of this hundredth anniversary of the end of world war one and i'll look back at your comments now Miles says um, it was with the Dutch that the indigenous people entered into the two row Wang Pum peace and friendship treaty in 1613 uh, at present day Manhattan yes absolutely and my ancestors um, were uh, both good and evil um, my first ancestor the the patriarch of the conover family whose name was wolfer gerritsen von kohenhofen um, had three sons his second son uh, was actually killed by native americans for um, good reason for something that he and others had done uh, but um, Wolfert his father had been instrumental in founding Manhattan Brooklyn 
Albany and Rensselaer. And when he was at Rensselaer uh, in the late part of his life, the European community at that time, which is up near Albany, New York, uh, the European community was only 12 people and they were living in the middle of the Iroquois nation, but they were able to live in peace. And so there is something important to think about in that context. Um, and um, Jebediah says, God bless all those who served and everyone sacrificed everything to defend those who they loved in World War I. Uh, Miles says, fascinating to learn this history, Skip. Thanks. I was at Versailles this summer. Your reading makes me more aware of its significance over just a work of architecture and interior decor, uh, a way for young men to show they are men. I wrote that down. Yep, absolutely. And so anyway, okay, that is my, um, that is my meditation for today. And now I'm going to excuse myself and have my lunch and then go and render my honor salute to my fellow veterans.